Western society is in the throes of a cultural revolution. Whatever we choose to call this menacing force, whether identity politics, wokeness, race communism, my guest today, the social scientist Eric Kaufman, is perhaps its shrewdest and best informed critic. In his forthcoming book, Taboo, he defines cultural socialism as a commitment to worshipping racial, gender and sexual minorities as accredited victim groups. The aim of the activists is to seize control of our civilization with an eye to remaking it, tyrannically if need be, on behalf of these marginalized identities and against their wicked oppressors. If national heritage, freedom of speech, or any other values we might care to preserve are casualties of this curative onslaught, so what? That only goes to show how such things have been subtly enlisted to perpetuate systemic injustice all along. Eric Kaufman, thank you so much for joining me on The Forge. Um, there has been no shortage of books devoted to unpicking the origins of, of woke or what you call cultural socialism. But what prompted you into supplying us with yet another one? I'm not complaining. I'm, yeah, I'm pleased that you did, but, but out of interest. Well, for a sake, I mean, I have been studying the cultural left ever since my PhD in the mid-1990s, where I was looking at the factors that led to, if you like, the decline of the WASP in... 20th century, mid 20th century America. And so I was interested, in, and, and that got me sort of looking at, for example, the liberal progressives, the young intellectuals of the left modernists of the early 20th century United States, their response to large scale immigration at the time from Southern and Eastern Europe, non Protestant. Um, so I kind of had that background already. Then, of course, we're into this era, and I've, I've always understood that there's kind of a clash between the cultural left worldview and the worldview that wants to sort of preserve a certain kind of cultural national identity. And that really is the tension that we are, are living in in an extreme form, but that tension was already there earlier in the 20th century. It's a, it's a little late in the day, though, isn't it? I mean, like, so I think it was in 1992 that Pat Buchanan, you mentioned the culture war, though, Pat Buchanan made his famous speech at the Republican National Convention in 1992, talking about the fact that there was this culture war raging. It was a huge problem. Conservatives needed to pay more attention to it. And e even if it was popular with the conservative activists, I suppose, at the time, it was considered by people like George H.W. Bush to be a little bit vulgar. And there, and th and there has remained this sort of prejudice against talking about cultural matters on the right ever since, this idea that it's, there's something fundamentally low status about it. We should, we should be focusing on economics, we should be focusing on growing the, the pie of GDP and all the rest of it. Do, do you sense that uh, more people on the right are waking up to the significance of the cultural war and, and realizing that culture really does count, it does matter, it's not just this, you know, it's not, it's not just this sideshow which can be blissfully ignored? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, this is really the tectonic shift that is occurring, mm -hmm. the realignment away from the older universalist missionary nationalism of particularly the Republican Party, if you take mm -hmm. in the United States, that neoconservative thrust to focus yes. only on low tax foreign policy and maybe we'll allow a little bit of religious right in that that, <laughs> what, that fusion what they call fusionism yeah. which was the basis yes. of the republican national committee and establishment republicanism of course has now been really overthrown to a large extent not fully of course nikki haley and others sure. are still standard bearers for that but there's been a shift now to, to thinking about culture on two there's really three because there's really three culture wars here i mean the first is the moral majority religious social conservative issues around you know gay marriage and uh, abortion and these sorts of issues mm -hmm. which start rising in the early 80s under reagan and the moral majority it was the secular humanists against the religious conservatives sure. now that was culture war one we then move in to with buchanan now starting to touch on these issues around the border yeah ethnic change we're now starting to talk about the globalist nationalists which is culture war two yes that is a much bigger deal in terms of electoral politics it's more salient and today as it's well it's much more salient today and, and of course we're, we're talking now we're having yeah, to have yeah. another populist uh, revival in a way mm -hmm. another populist moment mm -hmm. post pandemic post mm -hmm. you know cost of living Indeed. um but then we have this third culture war which is really around political correctness it is around the past mm. That, you know, to some degree has, has older echoes. So affirmative action, for example. Um, now, affirmative action and the English only movement of mm. the 1980s, right? This was when the politics of affirmative action You're talking about in the, United in States, the U.S. Yeah. first begins. Mm. This idea that, no, we're not going to have instruction in multiple languages in schools. Mm. Uh, we're actually going to try and make English the official language. So that, that was a kind of culture war. Mm -hmm. I mean, it didn't have the same 
national purchase the same domination, I think, mm. as, as, as it does today. But it's the ancestor of where we are. Mm. So what I think is, is you know, what's happening now across the West is that the electorates, the base, if you like, are, more, are in a more cultural position where those are the issues they prioritize. Uh, and so there's been a realignment from left, right on economics to mm. quote unquote nationalist globalist on culture. Yes, uh, but yeah. at the elite level, we're having also a third level, which is really around the, what we think of as the culture war, which is really uh, what I would call cultural socialism on the one hand, which is about um, equal outcomes for identity groups and emotional harm protection. Mm -hmm protection from being offended for identity groups versus two things. One is the enlightenment, free speech, scientific truth. The other is um, national heritage, culture, statues, uh, literature, whatever. And, and so we've, we've got, that is now being overlaid on mm. these culture war two issues around immigration and globalization. Yes. We're talking a lot about uh, the United States there, and I think, it, I think you would agree that generally when you speak to conservatives in the United States, whether you're talking to the base, or whether you're talking even to many of the elites in Washington, there is this understanding now, belated perhaps, but this understanding that the culture war isn't a sideshow, it does matter a great deal. Like why do you think in Britain it, it seems that, um, you know, uh, sort of establishment Tories haven't really got that memo? I mean, I remember uh, Rishi, Rishi Sunak, the present prime minister, saying only a year or so ago that I'm not going to cross the road to start a culture war, as though there isn't one already raging under his nose. Like, why, do, why is there this hesitance on the part of British conservatives, so-called, mm. to realise that the culture war matters? It's not just a sideshow that can be, as I say, blissfully ignored. Yeah, absolutely. And, and well, I think there are two issues here in Britain. Yeah. I mean, you've got, I mentioned culture war two, which is mm. around immigration and ethnic change. And then there's culture war three, which is around cancel culture and, and what I call deculturation, mm. some call critical race and gender theory, which is attacks on the past and mm -hmm. on the dominant culture. Mm -hmm. So if, in terms of that culture war two, I mean, if you look at um, public opinion in this country, I mean, clearly immigration is a high salience issue. Mm. For conservative voters, it's an extremely high salience issue. So the first astounding thing is to see the conservative party not responding to the top issue amongst its voters. I mean, that's, that's the, the first question. Um, uh, the second question is what they're doing on, on woke and what they're doing on culture war three issues. Uh, they're not really doing much on either. Uh, they've done a little bit, but not that much. Obviously, immigration has doubled under their watch, and, and mm -hmm. that's like six times higher than what they initially promised the level would be. Why are they not responding? I think it's just because the recruitment, the pipeline into the Conservative Party comes from elite universities, certain kinds of backgrounds, ambitious people who just want to be in power because mm. this is the most successful party in yes. the West. Yeah. So it's attracted a certain type of person who is either they don't care that much about ideas or to the extent they have any kind of notion of ideology, it's that sort of Hayekian, Thatcherite, liberal conservatism. Uh -huh. Now, there were obviously the John Hayes's and Miriam Cases and Danny Krugers. There is a group who are more nat nationally conservative, mm -hmm. but they are the minority. And mm -hmm. until the, con the British Tory party goes through the same kind of process that mm -hmm. the American Republican Party went through under Trump and the Tea Party, they overthrew the establishment. The establishment mm. is still in control here. And that's, until that happens, we're not going to see the realignment occurring at the elite level yes. that has already occurred at the voter coalition, at the base level. The base is already realigned. Yeah, yeah. The elites are, are in, stuck in the past. Yeah, it's interesting, though, yeah. isn't, it, isn't it? Because that you, you mentioned there that there's this division in the, in the Conservative Party between people who are sort of nationally minded, who think that culture does matter, and the people who view culture as a, as a secondary issue when compared mm -hmm. to how are, we going to grow, how are we going to grow GDP, how are we going to you know, um, uh, uh, get our supply forms, uh, our, right. our supply side reforms through and all the rest of it. But what they don't seem to grasp, and, I, and, I, and I'm wondering if there is any movement that you have managed to uh, tease out in your, in, your, in your hunt for data on this score, there doesn't seem to be this understanding that whether or not you are interested in the left's latest cultural maneuver, it's likely that the left's latest cultural maneuver is interested in you. Because, I mean, if you, even if you want to be a Hayek, a Hayek and a sort of neoliberal Thatcherite, do you really think that if we have a generation of young people being taught that capitalism is systemically racist and that it's sort mm. of intrinsically ad ad advantage in favor of whites. Do you really not think that that's going to have a, an impact on how much purchase your, your sort of Hayekian ideas are going to have over the next generation of voters? I, I don't grasp why so many of them 
are just completely unaware of that. Well, I mean, I think, you know, there's a couple of things going on here. I mean, one is this whole issue of respectability and being invited to the right dinner parties. <laughs> and, you know, th and this was true also in the U.S. case. I mean, the if you look at the unwillingness to legislate against affirmative action, which is within the power of the mm. states, mm. why have only four of them, most mm. of which are not even Republican? I mean, it's very few Republican states that have outlawed affirmative action in government contracting, for example. Uh, and, you know, Richard Hanania's book talks about mm. this, and they were quite open. We didn't want to be accused of being a racist. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is what's kind of going on now here, is that touching these culture war subjects, touching immigration, is seen as a bit, you know, uncivilized, ungentlemanly, it makes you look like potentially open to being called a racist. Do you want to invite that person over mm. to a respectable dinner party? And I think that st those status considerations are uh, play a big role in why a lot in the party. They would love to be able to sit down with BBC journalists. And, you know, I, I, would just, I was just reading something, a, a, a Nick Cohen in his uh, substack. I don't necessarily follow it, but I noticed he had a substack and he was quoting Cummings, Gove, and mm. Johnson saying during the Brexit campaign in the early stages, uh, we don't want to talk about immigration. Mm. We, want to, we want to focus this on the institutional benefits to Britain and Brexit. Mm. Mm. Um, they were quite conscious that this was not a respectable thing to do. They wanted to make Brexit respectable. Mm. Now, they had to, in the end, do some accommodation because they knew they needed the votes from Farage and the immigration issue, so they bent in that direction. But once they got in, they reverted to type and they wanted to be respectable. So I think that's a major motivation. Uh, the other motivation is a lot of them just don't care. You know, Johnson would be an example of that. I mean, he doesn't really share the, the worldview of most of his voters. And mm. therefore, there's a, a, a misalignment there. And then, so the political system needs to adjust. It needs ultimately to align the elites better with, with the base. Um, now, of course, the elites have some freedom to shift public opinion and create it, but I don't think they have a ton of freedom. And I think ultimately this is going to have to be some sort of a revolution at the elite level. I see, yes. Um, I, I, I represent um, the European Conservative, obviously, and so I, I, I go to um, Europe a, f a fair bit and I go to these conferences and it's always very interesting to see like, what um, contribution different nations are making uh, to, um, you know, those conferences. So, for example, the Hungarians punch above their weight in sending lots of pe people. The Israelis, uh, not technically European, but they punch, they punch above their weight as well. There are lots of, and and they also punch above their weight in terms of um, reaching young people. There's lots of evidence to suggest, as I understand it, that um, you know uh, movements like Mar Marine Le Pen's uh, Rassemblement National and Georgia Maloney's party in Italy, then they're much better at mobilising youth support on behalf of a sort of for want of a better word, a kind of sovereigntist, national, mm. conservative revival in their respective countries. And yet, I haven't noticed anything analogous occurring in the Anglosphere. It seems that, like, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the demography isn't really on the side of national conservatism in the Anglosphere as much as it could perhaps be on the continent. Do you have any sort of preliminary I think that's ideas why that is? I think you're right. I mean, there are, there is, of course, and we may get onto this later, there's obviously a big gender split in the Anglosphere where, where men are... Younger males mm. are are quite different, at least attitudinally, to mm. younger females. Mm. Um, there are, is obviously a lively podcast debating sphere, and and this question of national it's an interesting one. I mean, I do think there is intellectually a vibrant national conservative conversation. One of the questions is how that's pitched to you know you, you have the pop the, with the proportional representation system clearly in Europe you've got populist parties that have a secure legislative base representation in the assembly, mm. uh, which gives them certain power, which allows them to have a certain appeal. You know, that is a bit of a, a weakness in the first past the post systems of most uh, Anglo countries. Uh, and mm. so that's one issue. But I also think the other is there is this more individualistic kind of libertarian streak. Mm. That there's an alternative tradition in conservatism that's been the dominant tradition that still is powerful that in my view needs to be not totally overthrown but needs to be sort of rebalanced yes. by something a bit more 
collectivistic, not, not state collectivistic, but is more about something to do with community and security. Yes. That needs to be rebalanced intellectually a bit more. And rediscovering what Roger Scruton called the first person plural. Like you have two, mm. you have two first persons that really go on in politics. You've got the, the I and the we, and liberalism right. has, has emphasized the I, me, 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 you know, sort of this, this cult of maximizing autonomy on all fronts. You know, that, that needs to be... That, you can only really have rights which are secured at scale when they exist within a, 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 a solid community. I mean, it's, we can talk about this later as well. I mean, uh, it's, it's much harder to get what we might call, for want of a better word, liberal values mm. to have purchase on a population when there isn't a very powerful sense of collective identity, which makes that liberalism possible because, you know, liberalism requires, in order to work at scale, it requires a high trust society and homogeneous societies just tend to be much more mm. successful on that, on that front. I think we will actually get into it, though, because um, so you mentioned there, we can get into it now. You, so one of the uh, distinctions uh, that you, you, you talked to, uh, to me about before, which I'm sure um, uh, you, you go into further in your, in your new book, which is called uh, Taboo. Can you, can you remind the viewers of the full title? Yeah, so it's, it's called Taboo, How Making Race Sacred Led to a Cultural That's Revolution. Right. That's right, yeah. Um, you talk, um, cultural socialism and old-fashioned economic socialism of the Marxist variety actually are not, they're different in a number of ideological respects, but they're also different in terms of their ability to appeal to different types of demographics. And you talk particularly about how women considered at scale are much more likely to be attracted to cultural socialism than they were to economic socialism. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And there, are, I think there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, John Byrne Murdoch's piece in the FT seemed mm. to go viral on this, although actually the, this kind of a piece has been out. I did one about a year ago. Mm. And so, yeah, the, the, the findings are quite striking. And I think they're very robust in many countries. Um, you know, I'll just take two examples. Canada, you compare young men and young women. Young men are twice as likely to be conservative voters as young women. Mm. Um, you, you know, they're like 25 points apart. You look at... Uh, the U.S. case as well. I mean, there's this growing split, even even amongst young U.S. elite students. You know, there's a there's a growing split. I think it's now 15 point difference in the share mm. calling themselves liberal. Um, and so, yeah, I think that now. Why is that? I'd say there's a couple of reasons. One is I think women tend to fall in behind the communal norms. So, what are the kind of elite, prestige, civilized communal norms that are being propounded now? At one time, it would have been temperance, and I'm sure that women would have been more likely to be against drink. Solid uh, Methodists. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, mm. That was the prestige. Mm. And in fact, the largest, in the U.S., the largest movement was called the Women's Christian Temperance Union. <laughs> and they were also in favor of things like immigration restriction. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I think in all of these ways, women would have been more conservative. Uh, and in fact, up until 1970, in the survey data, were more conservative than men. Uh, and it's really only since about 2004 that you start to see a slight departure. Um, that's one thing. So I think that women are falling behind what they're being taught in schools by the government as the, what, this is what you should be. They're more conformist at scale. They're more conformist, less likely to be a contrarian. Okay. And, and, and the other aspect is, of course, identity socialism, which, you know, is about race, sex, and gender. So it is about feminism. It's mm. part of one of the holy trinity mm. uh, of uh, the, 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 well, the, what I would call the woke trinity, race, gender, sexuality, that are sacred in a way. Mm. So they are in some ways beneficiaries. I mean, if you take a kind of purely Marxist, self-interested kind of view of this, then yes, that women are beneficiaries of the system. I mean, leaving aside the trans issue yes, for a minute. Yeah. So, whereas there's no, no question that men are not beneficiaries of the system. Mm -hmm. So on the totem pole of, of oppression points, mm. women, they may not be at the top, but they are mm. higher than other groups like men. So I think those two things are largely explaining it. I know some people say that that there is this evolutionary thing about caring and, and that, 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 that that's why women are, are tend to be more likely to be woke is that, mm. you know, they're more compassionate and caring. And I think my response to that is that actually it's, it's, it's not a sufficient explanation because it's the question is always, who do you care about? Mm. So in the early 20th century, for example, uh, the figure of the vulnerable, vulnerable white women in the South being preyed on by the African American rapist, etc. That that was used in pro lynching propaganda, and, mm. and women were were you know even progressives, uh, you know liberal progressives, were very much attracted by by that narrative. So the question always when you're talking about compassion is, who are you compassionate for? Mm. 
and who are you antagonistic towards. So if you are very compassionate towards trans people, what about the women who have to admit these people into their spaces? Mm -hmm. Are you compassionate towards them? If you're very compassionate to African Americans being, being admitted to universities because they're underrepresented, mm -hmm. where is your compassion for the whites and Asians who are being discriminated against? It's always about who is the target. And so I think that that's given by ideology, that the target tells you to feel sorry for groups A and B mm. and to be hostile to groups C and D. So the ideology is directing the compassion. Mm. Compassion on its, on its own is a bit of a blank page. Um, and so I'm not as convinced by the Bo Weingart uh, and Corey Clark kind of arguments around that. But we could probably yeah. nevertheless make the more general statement that any ideology which does see it fit to couch itself in terms of care yeah. and does so in a way which is at least plausible, depending on who the object of care is, in this, right. it will have more success than women than, say, something, than an ideology which couches itself in terms of scientific hard-headedness and justice. Right, right. So you're right. So therefore, the older economic Marxian socialism, which yes. very much was into was this, that. this idea of, you know, inevitable contradictions leading mm -hmm. to the inevitable march of modernity. It was and it's very kind of it was nerdy. cerebral. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was absolutely <laughs> it was nerdy. Uh, yes. Mode of production and all these yeah, sorts yeah. of terms, right? So that was less feminine, no question about it. Yes. Um, but however, you could say that nationalism, which has this emotional appeal, which is about mm. motherland, it has a strong feminine appeal as well. Mm. Um, and so I, I sort of, we were talking earlier and I mm. said, I bet you that Palestinian women are yeah. more likely to say October 7th was justified. Uh, you might get more dissent from Palestinian men. If I were mm. to bet, I, mm. I, 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 that's how I would sure. play it because it's the flip side of compassion is, is mm. hatred for those who are uncompassionate. Mm. So the hatred goes towards the Israelis and the compassion goes to the Palestinians, it's not compassion for the uh, Israelis that Indeed. were killed. And, and, it's, and well, what you're saying, and, it, yeah. and, and uh, I would have to agree with this, is that if, if we ask the question, what is in the driving seat, fundamentally it's mm -hmm. the ideology that's in the driving seat, and compassion right. to the extent that it's in the picture at all, it's just made use of. Right. In, that's, that's the way I would see it. Yeah, I see. Well, so another thing that um, is, uh, I, as I understand it, so we talked there about the difference between cultural socialism, as you call it, or race communism, or, or wokeness, or whatever, we, the difference between that and sort of old-fashioned socialism or even right. old-fashioned old sort of you know scientific socialism or Marxism so to speak uh, but none, none, as I understand it, you also dissent from the popular post-liberal uh, idea well represented by people like Patrick Deneen and Sarab Amari mm. that um, cultural socialism is fundamentally just the next stage in the in, in, in the liberal revol revolution, i.e. like classical liberalism is to blame for the, the crisis in which right. we, we find ourselves. You actually think that a, a, a revival of what you call cultural liberalism or like negative liberalism mm. or procedural liberalism, whatever you want to call it, the kind of Anglo John Stuart Mill type liberalism right. would serve us well. And, and, it, and the, the, you know, wokeism doesn't really owe any debt to that. Tradition. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sort of in an odd place because I sort of am dissenting from the post liberals. Yes. But I'm also dissenting from people like Yasha Monk and, and others who claim mm -hmm. that this is all about a kind of culturalized Marxism. Mm -hmm. It's a departure from this virtuous thing that existed before. So yeah, yeah. I do see that there was a big problem in liberalism. But there was a mm. problem in what I would call modern liberalism, which is distinct from classical liberalism. It's the John, uh, John Rawls, the, multi, the liberal multiculturalism of Charles Taylor and Will Kimlick. This sort of mid to late 20th century fusion of the left and liberalism, which is the dominant way of thinking in academia in, in much of our mm -hmm. culture. That ideology, I think, is, the, is a problem, and I think it's a bigger problem than cultural Marxism, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, the cultural Marxism, yes, the content of critical race theory does come from Derek Bell and, and, and all of that cultural Marxist tradition, but um, what, I, what I place a lot of emphasis on is this modern liberalism that is about compassion for identity, you know, marginalized identity groups. Mm -hmm. You know, when we don't want to overthrow society in a revolution the way that, that the Weather Underground or black militants do, but, but we want to, you know, we're, we're compassionate and we're guilty. Mm. I think guilt and compassion ratcheting, so you can go from, uh, we have to be nice to these downtrodden minorities, to, uh, well, actually, you know, we should have a speech code because, you know, if you say, mispronounce somebody's last name or wear the wrong Halloween costume, that too is kind of not being nice. Mm. Uh, oh, oh, wait a minute now, um, having going skiing where everybody is white, that too is not, you know, basically it allows for this creeping, 
ratcheting, boundless kind of evolution toward radicalism. Yes. So my, my argument is actually that modern liberalism sows, plants the seeds of this radicalism. Um, and that's to some degree why Richard Hanania in his book, he's talking about these evolutionary ratcheting court cases where disparate impact and hostile environment and affirmative, affirmative action are constantly interpreted in broader and broader and broader terms mm. to the point where criticizing the supreme leader, leader of Iran at work is yes. Islamophobic, right? So, so I, pl I think that's important. <laughs> now, I don't think that that's the same liberalism as classical liberalism, mm -hmm. but they, there is a, so, so I think you can have a procedural liberalism mm -hmm. in which you have then different versions of the good life, including mm -hmm. the conservative one. What, 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 what I, what I said, but in called value pluralism. Yeah. So, yeah. so whereas Deneen and, and Amari would say, once you have this procedural liberalism, in, it will immediately default mm -hmm. towards what Berlin would call the positive liberalism. So yes. you would eventually get immediately this idea of, okay, mm -hmm. well, yeah, you can have whatever view you want, but into that vacuum immediately will come this kind of left progressive yeah. thing. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. And I think you can have, you know, if you look at the Far East, you know, there's a there's a broadly liberal society yes. procedurally there, but clearly the ethos is very different from that of the West. I, so I should say that I do agree with you. And I, and I, I, I also, I, I, I think that... Um, People like Amari and Deneen play fast and loose with their definitions of liberalism. They, are, they don't right. pay sufficient care to the kind of sort of what may, what may seem pedantic, but the but very important distinction, conceptual distinctions you're drawing between these various strands of liberalism. And, it, and it's true, I, I would agree that the, the idea of organizing everyone into their sort of racial silos and then pitting them against each other it goes against the, the whole ethos of classical liberal, liberalism, which is that, yes, we care about minorities, but the ultimate minority is the individual. It's not the blacks or the, the, mm. the Jews or the gays or whatever it might be. We, the individual is the person who deserves those protections, not the individual as a member of some tribe or some group. So like, clearly cultural socialism is in conflict in very important ideological ways with um, with classical liberalism, so I would agree with right, you. Right. I would I would agree with you on that. But one thing that I have been thinking about is not so much that, not so much that workerism or cultural socialism or whatever we want to call it, is a logical extension of liberalism. Like everything I've just said there yeah. suggests that it isn't really. But it does seem to me that in two very important respects, um, li classical liberalism does uh, supply furnish some of the conditions within which cultural socialism is likely to thrive. And the first of those, I think, the first one of those is demographic. And sorry, cultural socialism is likely to thrive. Mm. I think the first one of those is demographic, and the second one is spiritual. And like, you've written a lot about demographics on the, you know, your, right. your, your book, um, excellent. I think twenty eighteen book, White Shift, goes into immigration and identity in 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 a, in a, in a certain amount of, of detail. It just seems to me, as someone living in Britain, that it is impossible to to s separate the explosion of racial identity politics from the demographic transformation through which our countries. Have, uh, countries in the West have gone over the last 20 to 30 years. And it seems to me that liberals are responsible for th that state of affairs, the fact that we are these incredibly diverse countries today. And it's just, it just is a fact that in homogeneous countries, identity precedes politics. Like politics becomes about how are we as a collective people going to achieve what we want to achieve. achieve. Whereas in very diverse parts of the world, identity, uh, politics becomes about identity because, and you've written about this in in white shift, all of a sudden, everything, whether it's the building of a statue or naming right. a school, it's it's perceived to alter the distribution of power between competing ethnic groups. So it, is liberalism in that sense not responsible for being indifferent to the way in which our societies were becoming um, balkanized? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting because there's been this evolution of liberalism. I mean, John Stuart Mill, you actually find a fair bit of nationalism there. You know, he defended British imperialism, defended the idea of a nation. Uh, so it was liberalism within a national frame. Mm. It then escapes that as we get into the 20th century. Um, I'd say the first decade of the 20th century, I mean, the liberal progressives had this very cosmopolitan view of Americanism. They were trying to get away from the New England wasp type Americanism. Mm -hmm. And then in Europe, you had the pan-European movement, yes. which was again, supranational between the wars. Um, so yeah, I think what occurs is liberalism initially was very pro-national. Liberal, the liberals and the nationalists were kind of together in the 19th century true, because yes. it was seen as the progressive thing to do. Mm -hmm. We're breaking down local regional distinctions, mm. common language, imperial, imperial yeah, building uh, the railways, yeah. all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and then as we go 
past World War I, yeah. it starts to be anti-national. Yes. Um, and that's a big change. Um, you know, if you think of the French Revolution, it was a liberal revolution, it was nationalist, it was against the monarchy, yes. it was popular sovereignty. All of that in the 19th century, and then into the 20th century, we shift and we get this anti-nationalist liberalism starting to emerge. And that is, does have some antecedents. So for, but I also think that's not a purely, I guess you could say it's liberalism across borders in that sense. Yes. Um, and so they're advocating novelty and diversity as well. And that's, mm -hmm. I, that is important. Novelty and diversity, not in the sense of we want equality, but more in the sense of wasps are boring, you know, they have no culture, etc. So we want to have, bring in these interesting exotic peoples mm -hmm. to spice things up and change is better than tradition, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, or does go back to John Stuart Mill. Those mm -hmm. are kind of positive ideals smuggled in. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually think we need to roll that back. So we have to have a much more neutral kind of liberalism that, that doesn't say, you know, you should be always seeking out the new and the different as opposed to the traditional. You shouldn't always be seeking to be different rather than in common. Uh, that is going to be a, a shift to the perfectionist ideal in the society. Mm -hmm. So I think we really have to, yes, 20th century liberalism, but I think that's what I would call modern and ultimately becomes left liberalism within 10 years. So by the 20, by the 1910s, it's already moving in that leftist direction. I would have to agree with you. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, just, it's just an historical fact that in the 19th century, nationalism and liberalism were allies because, right. they, because they, 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 I suppose, I, I would say that that was a result of historical contingency. I don't think that has anything mm. to do with liberalism as such. Like because, I mean, they pitched themselves jointly against multi-ethnic multi religious yeah. empires and right. so it made sense to, to fetishize the nation in that liberal context right. whereas to, it seems to me that if we just consider liberalism as a sort of textbook philosophy it it struggles to it was difficult to make a liberal case for borders it's difficult to make a liberal case for national identity because the liberal is uh, the classical liberal here i'm talking about the classical liberal not sort right. of later later bastardizations perhaps which i agree with you that those bastardizations took place but the, the classical liberal wants to fund fundamentally wants to liberate the, the individual from anything which can make a claim on him from outside. And so that's why th there's this concern for religious liberty. We want to make sure that people, we, ca we carve out a space for the individual, even if he does live in a very religious country, to dissent from that. And equally, we want to carve out a space for the individual to pick his own identity. Maybe he doesn't feel like he wants mm. to be a British person. Right. So it's, it's very difficult to make liberal arguments, I find, classically liberal arguments for borders and for uh, a, a strong sense of national identity. The liberal basically believes that our identities are chosen, not inherited, and that they have this resistance to the idea that human beings are instinctively tribal, and therefore they're very indifferent, as, as, as far as I can tell, classical liberals again, to the mass dissolution of, of, of peoples and the dissolution of borders. And the, the, the simple fact is the more you make Britain a sort of a tribalistic battleground by just sponsoring more and more immigration and assuming that it will all be okay because right. we're all individuals, they, all of a sudden, cultural socialism is going to have a huge purchase over those various competing identities in a population. So liberalism doesn't logically lead to cultural socialism, but it furnishes conditions within which cultural socialism is just going to thrive. Yeah, I mean, I think, so I wouldn't agree completely. I mean, I think that, I mean, I, you know, just for other reasons, would like to see nations and national particularity mm -hmm. be maintained. And so mm -hmm. that's why I'm not a pure individualist liberal. Mm -hmm. Now, you could make, obviously, a liberal case and say, well, without security of property rights and a, a legal system and all of that, mm -hmm. which requires a certain level of social trust, mm -hmm. and you can't have that when you have a borderless society, you can't have those secu that security, and you can't have that smooth, high trust functioning. So that mm -hmm. would probably be the way you'd argue it mm -hmm. as a sort of liberal who didn't care about the nation but cared about the stability yes. and, and, and the property rights and other things the nation brings. So maybe there is still an argument that can be made even from a purely liberal background for, for the nation on purely functional grounds. But getting away from that, uh, which is very getting, getting very abstruse, mm -hmm. um, I think that... For, you know, if there was no diversity, let's say there was just no demand to immigrate, uh, I still think you would have had, certainly on feminism, certainly on the LGBT stuff, mm -hmm. and then in countries that have an indigenous uh, past, or, yes. and, and there would be that war on the past, mm -hmm. uh, or a black minority as in the U.S., um, so I don't think it's necessarily the immigration that has driven it. Now, of course, they will make use of 
immigrants, anything, anything they can, if they yeah. can use them. Now, yeah. of course, it's also inconvenient if you have, say, Muslim immigrants who are protesting against, you know, gay marriage or whatever, the LGBT yeah. stuff. So, and and so, it's not a clear cut case. Mm. The other thing is, you look at the U.S. You know, some of the most radical expressions of wokeness are coming from uh, the whitest area, like. Oregon, for example, is one of the whitest, certainly of the coastal states. Yeah. Not entirely, but one of the whiter places. Portland is one of the whiter cities. Sure. Um, and whereas some of the more, particularly, cons- you know, large African American population cities, yeah, you get certain things woke, but certain things you don't get. I mean, New York. If you compare New York and Portland, for example, I mean, you see Portland is more woke across yeah. the board. Um, and I think certainly if you compare whites and non-whites the culture war split is much sharper within this. Now that, that means you have more based whites, but you also have more woke whites mm-hmm. than you have in, amongst minorities. Mm-hmm. It's just a sharper, this, this religion of anti-racism, to use mm-hmm. McWhorter's term, is just much stronger amongst whites. Uh, and now what is going on there is I think, they are, the whites are getting the mental, the, the mind virus, yes. uh, and they're, they're much more engaged in this conversation. So they're more susceptible to the mind virus. Now it's not to say, Particularly highly educated blacks also have the mind virus, yeah. but I, th- I think it's somewhat independent. Is all I would say is I think this is a particular problem within Western culture and within the majority groups in Western culture that's come because of the mutation mm. of perfectionist liberal ideas. Uh, you know, yes, there's some inputs from Marxism and, and so on, but I think it's mainly a mutation of perfectionist liberalism. Absolutely, and so you're yeah. you're quite right to mention the fact that the different Anglosphere countries are, are, are different because you know. They're, 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 in America, for example, there was always going to be a small, like, th- like I think roughly 13% black population right. just because of the, the contingencies of American history. Ditto with the Canadians, not with uh, uh, the descendants of slaves in the case of Canadians, yeah. but sort of what I think is, we were supposed to refer to as First Nation. Right, right. First, First Nation Canadians. But in the country, so I'm tra- all I'm trying to do with my sort of demographic yeah, yeah. thesis here is explain why this has all of a sudden got so much purchase in Britain, because Britain was until very recently an, an incredibly yeah. homogenous homogeneous country with a, a powerful sense of collective identity and i don't see any reason why like assuming that um that, that sort of process of mass demographic transformation did not take place you're quite right we might still have the lgbt stuff we might still have the the, the, the sort of feminist politics right. but like racial politics wouldn't have had any purchase over the british population any more than it does in japan today because we, we had sort of de- right. de- de- demographic homogeneity rates similar to japan sure. as, as recently as the 1960s and so so it seems to me that again again to bring it back to liberalism yeah. it is liberals who oversaw that process so even though they might be resistant to identity politics a good liberal has to be because the, mm, again yeah. the ultimate minority is individual not right like, you know your, your group identity nevertheless they have they have supplied the conditions within which it will thrive. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to, to run an experiment like mm. if you had Britain as a perfectly homogenous society now. I mean, my view is you would still have high wokeness. It would be around the sins of the past. Mm. We colonized these places, therefore we're awful, therefore, you know, Nelson or whoever, you know, Churchill is, mm-hmm. is a terrible person. You don't even have to have a single member of the minority in the country mm. to sort of whack yourself on the back and mm. accuse yourself of being... <laughs> you know, so so I, I don't think that's necessary. Now, of course, the fact you have them there gives a certain emotional appeal. You may only need a few tokens exactly. to, to march out in front of the cameras. Um, now, the question is whether, if you have a larger number of them, are they then... They could be perhaps clients that would vote for a left-wing party. So, and that, that the evidence suggests that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it does suggest that. So, so maybe that would bolster at least politically a coalition that sure. could keep these ideas a bit stronger than they otherwise would be. But I, I could equally imagine another situation where uh, a, a progressive, uh, entirely white progressive elite is able to browbeat everybody else, mm. take over institutions. Yes, not win any elections, mm. but essentially be able to browbeat the politicians on both sides to essentially accept their hegemony. Mm. I, I think so. I think it, liberal, negative liberalism per se, I don't think is a major ingredient. I don't think it makes much difference. Um, I think this is fundamentally a disease of the soul of the majority mm-hmm. in, in Western countries. Uh, that's where I would locate it first. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, if you go back to the US in the early 20th century, they certainly leveraged uh, the arrival of, of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe to make the case, yeah, you know, America's changing, it's becoming a diverse country, mm. you know, to, to make that claim about inevitability. But 
that really wasn't wasn't what was motivating them, or even was mm. guaranteeing their appeal. The appeal was very much to this kind of radical. Mm. The wasps are boring. The culture is terrible, and, and look how exotic and interesting yeah. these other places are. And we've got to sort of, we've got to hate ourselves. Yes, that that was the narrative. So I wanted. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I maybe this needs to be explained. This phenomenon, in, and again, I'm focusing again mm-hmm. him primarily on uh, racial and ethnic identity right. politics rather than other you know newfangled obsessions. Right. <laughs> uh, right. But it seems to me that uh, we've got two things that we need to explain here. We got to, we need to explain. This disease of the soul that you talk about, the mind virus, which I would completely agree with you, is primarily a problem of the the, the majority population in places like Britain and Canada. And the, your, your stuff about Oregon being just as just as keen right, on right. this, as, but and so these people do really seem, when it comes to cultural socialism, to be true believers. I mean, t- they are technically in favour of their own if they are they are white. They're technically in favour of their own children being discriminated against in hiring practices in, at universities, which, which is, a, which is a, an, right. an indicator yes. of, of serious belief if they, if they do believe that. But it, it seems to me that so, although we have these, again, primarily majority, um, again, in, in Anglo-Sphere countries, white people who are um, incredibly uh, have succumbed to the, the, the woke mind virus, so to speak, uh, it, how, it seems to me that when, when it does come to sort of tribalistic minorities, and these people do exist, I mean, like sure, Sadiq, sure. Sadiq Khan, of course. Uh, Humza Yusuf, okay. I mean, you know, um, and th- th- then they're not marginal either. They're not as marginal as, say, the Black Panthers were. They seem to be right. mainstream. They're on MSNBC, they're in, the, they're in Holyrood in Scotland, they're right. in the Mayor of London's office. Um, it seems to me that maybe explaining why they are attracted to work and explaining why the host population is attracted to work would be different. You could, it's more of a mental disease of the soul in the case of the white woman who wants her own son to be discriminated against if he's applying to Oxford or to Cambridge or wherever it might be. But is it not the case that for many of these tribalistic minorities, they just have, um, that they associate whatever is good with what advances the interests of their in-group. Right. And if you have differential rates of ethnocentrism in a population where there's a much stronger, for example, black consciousness in Britain, there's a much stronger Pakistani consciousness in Britain than there is like a white majority consciousness. It's considered vulgar even to talk about mm. the idea that whites should do identity politics. When you've got basically one, the majority group has had to unilaterally disarm right. on, on ethnocentrism while everyone is el- else is permitted to dial it up to 11, and is inclined to do so. Yeah. Like, it, 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 are we not explaining two different things here? Like, for someone like Sadiq Khan, they, he would be in favour of identity politics no matter how it dressed itself up. Whereas for someone like a w- w- white woman in a university, for example, she is a true believer and she does need to go through the whole catechism, catechism and the creed and the, the disease of the soul that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, there's really, because this term identity politics really means two things, mm. right? I mean, one is the religion. Yes. Which is the belief that minorities are good and majorities are bad. The other is the tribalism you talk about, mm. which is simply, I like my identity <laughs> and I yes. want to boost it as much as possible. Yeah, yeah both, those are both going on. And you're right, there's different dynamics. And, and amongst minority groups, it's the second Absolutely. one that's more important. Now, obviously, there are many different stripes of opinion within of different groups. We're talking generally here. And not talking yeah. generally. And the question is, is what proportion of these groups put their identity first mm. and are single-minded in wanting a either more immigration for their group or its foreign policy interests mm. and so on and so forth. And you're right, that becomes, eventually it evolves towards a society, societies that are uh, polycentric and balkanized. And mm. I'm thinking of, you know, Kenya, um, uh, Liberia. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think uh, it's pe- in the Caribbean, Trinidad, you know, Trinidad would be one or, or, Guyana, where you essentially you vote ethnic parties, it's mm. ethnic coalitions, mm-hmm. um, and politics voting is on on mm. ethnic lines. Even mm. Northern Ireland is an example of that. Um, yeah, so that is that sort of leads you towards a kind of tribal mm-hmm. political system where voting and parties are on ethnic lines rather than on programmatic lines. Mm. Um, and but of course, what we have in Britain, of course, or, or in any in the Western countries, is you have. A certain amount of that for minorities, and then the majority yeah. is split on, yeah, more yeah. on ideological lines. Yes. Now, there are, of course, in certain groups of minorities, there's more identification with the nation and the tradition. So, so Latino Trump voters or Asian Trump voters are more likely mm. to have a favorable view of white people. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so you, ha- you have a certain split, too, amongst minorities. It's also interesting, like someone like a, 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 a Hamza Yusuf or Sidi mm. Khan, is a certain type of Pakistani, like they're kind of 
saying things around LGBT, which are very yeah, which is so, odd. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so they're kind of they're <laughs> yeah, probably true. you know they're probably a break from the very conservative religious Pakistanis. Yeah, but they're also rejecting or feel rejected by the majority, and so they've come into this leftist yeah. identity, which somehow is congenial to yes. them. I think that's a type. You know, that's a certain yeah. type of person. You are right; well. they're yeah. classify in that way. But you see people like Humza Yusuf. Like, de- like deride the white majority in Scotland yes. in, in like the most yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the most disgusting terms. I mean, like if he was saying that about black people, if he was saying that about Jewish people, he right. would be over right. as as a as a political entity. And only the other day, I, I saw a clip of him on X or Twitter or whatever you want to call it, where he was calling himself a son of the soil of Pakistan. Like, if you had a a Celtic right. a Celtic ethnic person saying that about Scotland, he'd be dismissed as a sort of a blood and soil yes. nationalist. And so there's this, there is this, there are these very insidious double standards which do count against the host yeah. population, a sort of ethnocentric, maximal ethnocentrism for me, maximal cosmopolitanism for thee. And like th- that, right. that, that, that is not sustainable to have that running in a population. Oh, it is. And it's what I call asymmetrical mm. multiculturalism, mm. which I mm. term I, I use for like two thousand. Yeah. Well, actually, no, I used it in my 2004 book, actually. Oh, did you? on the rise and fall of Anglo-America. So that's a long... But yeah, ethnicity, and this comes from the 1910s, uh, um, left modern intellectuals like Randolph Bourne, that, you know, he wanted the wasps to be cosmopolitan, to Mm. slough off their ethnicity. He Mm. wanted the minorities to firmly not intermarry, not integrate, not assimilate. And that that duality, ethnicity is great for minorities, it's terrible for majorities, (laughs) right? And that's what we're living through, really, is the dialing up of that philosophy mm. and until we unpack that and dismantle it uh yeah and where is it heading where it's heading is polarization mm. and the within the majority group is where the polarization is happening it's Indeed. the true believers and their fellow travelers in the woke religion mm. against the larger let's say 60 percent of of people who want to conserve and preserve to some degree who want slower ethnic change Mm. who don't want to apologize for who they are uh and that's starting to emerge yeah more and more as i mean because in a way the left modernism as it became more virulent Mm. started to say oh yeah uh it's not just you know in the 1920s you had them making you know saying wasps are boring uh, they're not as don't have the same food and music as mm-hmm. these other groups. Now it's oh uh, the whites are are, are morally, you know, morally compromised, you mm-hmm. know, racist, and, and there's white supremacy. And these other groups mm-hmm. are are virtuous and spiritual and mm-hmm. all these things. So so it's just much more in your face. It's being shoved at students with critical race theory. It's been shoved in at workplaces with DEI, and it's harder and harder and harder to ignore. Now, it's all based on, of course, race taboos, which mm. prevent the majority from expressing itself, mm. which shame, constantly shame the majority mm. into silence. But now that there is at least, there seems to be a stronger movement trying to question that whole apparatus, which is built up over 100 years. Mm-hmm. And once we get into a situation where that is openly contested politically, we are mm. then into a new chapter, new era. And... What it's manifesting on, as is just increasing polarization. So we have polarization over ethnic change, and layered onto that is you have the progressive left accusing the people resisting of ethnic change of being yes. racist. Yeah. The people being accused of racist resenting that and accusing the other people of being essentially intolerant, woke, illiberals. And so we're getting we're, we're getting that layering of the culture war three issues around yeah, yeah. speech over the culture war two issues around ethnic change, yeah. and it's adding more division and and that's the the next stage i suppose is for this to all come together in electoral competition Mm. uh and where that goes is really much is the future of of western civilization no no, no, no biggie no biggie okay this what i want to ask you about this because you've studied um uh i think the, the the third um line in your in your subtitle to white shift is is, is this? It's the future of white majorities. I think. That, yes, what's that's the right. Title? Yes, the future of white majorities. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and you talk about that a great deal, and um, uh, so you, and you know a lot about it. One thing I've noticed is, that, and I, re- I should say, I regard this as an inc- incredibly cynical move. <laughs> uh, like, the, have you have you noticed that there's this tendency on the the le- liberal left to say, well, who are British people anyway? Like, what are the, who are the British people? Um, nice. Like, what does it mean to be a native British person? What does it mean to be indigenous? There's this sort of puzzlement over what it well who are the british people anyway um and i'd noticed that this doesn't apply when you want to 
like spread a, bro a blood libel against them. If you want to right. blame them for the sins of their ancestors, you yes. can define them very clearly indeed. They don't become yeah. this amorphous category. But how, how do we drive the precision on saying what it means to be a member of the ethnic majority in, in Britain? Right. So, well, you know, there, if we want to just talk almost academically, right, mm. ethnicity is about belief in common ancestry mm -hmm. marked up by some cultural marker, religion, language, or physical appearance, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have an ethnic majority. Now, in Britain, of course, you've got Scotland with ethnic Scots, England with ethnic English. Each of those has certain distinguishing features, or ethnic Welsh, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, there's a difference between archetypes, prototypes, and boundary types. Mm. So the prototype Welsh person will have a Welsh surname like Jones, mm -hmm. not, a, not a surname like Smith, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right? But obviously you don't have to be called Jones to be Welsh, <laughs> even ethnically. Mm. Uh, and, and similarly in, in England, you know, you can have a, you know, mm -hmm. a French sounding, uh, clearly you can have an Irish sounding, whatever, surname. Uh, it, it, so the question then, it gets down to, you know, it's a belief in common descent in some fashion. Uh, but is, is clearly it, there's been admixture, and, yeah. and, and there's clearly questions of boundedness. So there's, one of the arguments I made is, is, or I make is that you, know, you, get, you can have blurry boundaries mm. in a group, uh, but you have an archetype. You, you, so you have the archetype of, you know, like an English name, which would be, I don't know, Fleetwood. I'm just picking a name out of thin air, uh, as opposed to O'Leary, right? <laughs> so, so you have certain, and it's equally you would have an archetype physical appearance, but you could have somebody who might, you know, have some mix, uh, mixed race background or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, who could still be a member if they identified as a member, if they were accepted as a member. Now, the, of course, those are the ethnic dynamics of, mm -hmm. of who is a member of the ethnic majority. And, you know, that to some degree with melting, it's not that the archetype is going to change, but maybe the, the, the number of people who are closer to the archetype will, will decline perhaps a little bit over time. And the criteria can expand. Well, it de yes, it can. So, uh, so in the U.S. case, which is an easier one because we have a longer historical record of this, yeah. you know, it was always the case that a Dutch surname could be was part of the WASP group. Mm -hmm. you know, Roosevelt, for example, mm -hmm. Van Buren, they were mm -hmm. kind of seen as part of the mm -hmm. uh, ethnic majority going even back into the 19th, 18th century. What, whereas a German surname actually put you outside that group mm. for a long time, but then, or an Irish surname, but then you have. And certainly being Catholic. But then you had a kind of, you know, after 1960, the boundary shifted. It didn't, it wasn't just that you had to be Protestant and WASP. It actually meant, you know, if you were white, mm. uh, you were part of the white, this new white group. So there was a boundary extension to include Catholics and Jews. And Italians. Uh, yeah, after about 1970, let's say. Mm. Um, and, and in this country, in Britain too, you see that you know, where mm. people kind of have an Italian name, an Irish mm. name, whatever. So they're part of this broadly seen as being English. Um, and yeah, you, you have a certain boundary extension, but I still think the archetypes remain. There's no question that, you know, uh, Smith is a more American or, or English sounding name than De Niro, for example. <laughs> and if you, even if you poll Catholics in the U.S., mm. which is a more American, typically, typically American religion, Protestant or Catholic, they will say Protestant. Yes. So, so you, you kind of have the, the, the perpetuation of these prototypes and archetypes, but you, you maybe have the boundary criteria re relaxing over time a certain amount. Um, yes, yeah. Do you think that um, a lot of the confusion over this, like driving the precision yeah. on who, it, like who is part of the host population and who isn't. Do you think a lot of that is confected in order to try and deny the ability of the host population to define themselves and then defend their rights as, as, as a majority? So, I mean, like, yeah. no one ever gets confused about what it means to, for Jews to remain a, minor, a majority mm -hmm. in Israel. Like, no one ever right. seems to be particularly confused about what that would entail, what that would mean. Uh, the same with Han Chinese in Singapore. Like, I think both of these countries have... Like, like it's not that it, you can live as a minority in these countries, and I, I believe you you have the same rights under mm. the, under the law and all the rest of it. So the sort of li liberal values are, are salvaged to that extent in both countries. Right. Um, but you know there is this built-in assumption that we we're not going to tinker with our demographic balance, and it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to be a problem for the Han Chinese in Singapore to say who they are, and for the Jewish majority in Israel to say who who they are. Do you think that a lot of this confusion of like, oh, well, Britain is really just a mongrel nation, like we're the nation of immigrants, right. like th there is no such thing as being British, you know, all that sort of thing. Do you think that is largely just confected? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yes, because I think what you have are two stages. You know, stage one was the liberal deconstruction of the English ethnic majority. If we take this country uh, to say, well, you know, everyone's in England, we're just a mongrel nation, and it's just been, you know, Normans and whatever. <laughs> um, that was, the, so once you've deconstructed it, then you can say, well, hey, we've deconstructed it, there's nothing there, so immigrants have nothing to assimilate to, so therefore multiculturalism. Yeah, exactly. So it's a kind of two-step, right? And uh, it's very dishonest because in a way, they, the reason that there's nothing there is because you've deconstructed it. <laughs> so yeah, um, but, but, but now there is a fair, you know, fair point. Of, and then the other thing is this elision between boundary and prototype. This is the other thing. So yeah. you know, if I say to you, all accents are British accents, mm. Uh, well, because anybody who has a British passport who wants to be British, however they speak, they have to be treated equally as mm. a, equally British. And, and yeah, they, they have to be, you know, mm. so I, the, but the, this is what's called the fallacy of composition. Yeah. It's like me saying, um, you know, the NHS is terrible. Oh, you're criticizing nurses. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the same fallacy. It's a well-known fallacy, but it's a game they always play. Yes. They collapse a desire to preserve a critical mass of traits collectively with exclusion of people. Yes. Oh, you're saying that that you have to have a, you know that the, there's a British accent. Mm. Well, then you must be excluding somebody who doesn't mm. have a British accent. <laughs> I, you know, it's that game. Yeah. And so we can't yeah. talk about accent, and yeah, we can't yeah. talk about anything because, right? You know, it's excluding somebody at the margin. Mm. Whereas I, my view is, no, you can have a distinctively British accent. Uh, leaving aside the fact there are multiple regional accents, but yeah, let's just say, sure. you can have a distinctively British accent, and that's not in contradiction with saying that somebody can have any accent and still be equally British. Yes. It's the individual level versus the collective level, uh, and, and that's really what this debate is about on ethnicity, wanting to preserve a critical mass of certain traits at the collective mm. level, or at least to to make it slow enough that they assimilate and take on yes. the dissent myths of the established majority. So wanting that to exist doesn't mean you, you are excluding anybody on the grounds of race yeah, yeah. at the margin. But they'll always want to say, oh, you want to you know, conserve any critical mass of these traits, you're an exclusive, exclusionary at, at the level of the individual. And it's that constant invocation of the fallacy of composition mm. to, to always emotionalize and shut down any attempt to preserve and conserve anything cultural that's the dishonest move that's made and they and as, yeah. as, as I say they that um, fallacious reasoning is all of a sudden nowhere to be seen when it comes to saying well um, you know British people need to pay reparations for slavery or the British people need to pay reparations for colonialism the people who make that argument who and they're usually the same people mm, yeah they, they find it very easy to identify who a British person is when they want to, you know, extract resources from them in that way. So I mean, it, it, right. there, there, there's a sort of, there's a sort of, there's a very cynical and I think insidious double-sidedness to w when we can find the British person in the room and when all of a sudden is a Mongol right. nation we can't. And it's almost the reverse with with say a minority group where yeah. you know if you take a group like Palestinians they'll point to the most liberal secular yeah. right person uh, who's and that you know that becomes the Indeed. prototype not the sort of majority opinion yeah um so the, re the reverse strategy for minorities yeah it's interesting so and uh, you and i've spoken about this um before uh you have d d i think you described yourself to me once as a, as a rule a rule ut utilitarian right, bro right. broadly speaking and like for people who aren't well briefed on <laughs> different strands of utilitarianism i suppose like you, 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 I, it could be boiled down to this like probably most, most people know about utilitarianism is that it posits its fundamental principle is the greatest good for the greatest number but then all of a sudden if you if we permit that as a principle there are going to be um, idealized test cases in which it's very inadequate so that you might have you know someone you might have th four people in a hospital one without a liver one without a heart one without a kidney one with one without a uh, another, another vital organ I think <laughs> I, 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 my biology's off um, uh, and it's all of a sudden some unsuspecting person walks into the room and you think we don't have enough you know vital organs to save all of these people we could just kill that guy and harvest all of his organs and the greatest good the the, the good of the majority will be fulfilled by right, that right. like rural utilitarians like john stuart mill come along and say no these rules these these are uh, this utilitarian principle needs to be actionable in the real world and we can't have a, a, co a cooperative society in which anyone could walk into a hospital and is at risk of being grabbed and hmm. to torn it to them so so, so, so this principle, the greatest good for the greatest number, it needs to be designed to work in a law-governed society. And so all of a sudden that kind of tames the, what, could, what could be very extreme under different circumstances if we become too abstract. So you described yourself as a rule utilitarian. How do you uh, reconcile def defending 
uh, the rights of a majority to uh, maintain its culture, particularly, particularly if, it's an if their ancestors built that culture and for them, uh, with this idea that um, we should accord all voices equal weight in, in this kind of utilitarian calculus of like... Right, so, so there's a number of different ways there. I mean, one is the argument that if everybody in the world in their countries is able to have that degree of control, of con you know, to conserve their culture, for example, yeah. that provides a very a, a good. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a it's like saying let's let let me say that you know if I told you you can't feel closer to anyone in any individuals in the world than anybody else, and you have to allocate any charity equally to people without regard to how they're related to you in the world. You can't form any ties, mm -hmm. um, and, and and that's because we want you to treat everybody as exactly the same, um, and that's the most utilitarian way of operating. You can see where that is a very cramped human existence, because so much of what makes uh, human existence worthwhile is the special ties we have to friends and family, and co you know those who we feel closer to in the world. If we weren't allowed to have that, you know, and there've been these experiments, these communal experiments, mm -hmm. which say you can't favor your own child in child rearing over any of the other mm. community's children, and they've all failed. Yeah. Because it's so against human nature. We have a human nature, we have to work with that human nature. I mean, yes, we have to push against it in certain respects to have a good society, but we also have to push with it mm. in order for people to have fulfilled lives. And this is part of that argument, that mm. we need to recognize people have special obligations to subsets of the human race, uh, and that's what will provide the the greatest sense of psychological fulfillment in the mm. world. And that's how I would justify this in utilitarian grounds. By the way, I should also say that that's core to the new book, where my argument is very much against cultural socialism, is very similar to the argument against economic socialism, mm. is that we, you, in economic socialism, there's something called the economists use this term equity efficiency trade-off. The mm -hmm. more you redistribute, the more the pie shrinks. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you have to have some redistribution, but uh, if you want growth and you want the pie to grow, you have to have some inequality. Similarly, in culture, uh, if we want to have perfect e equality, you know, men and women and, and every racial group and, and, and every sexual group, and then you're going to have a smaller cultural pie mm. and less human flourishing. So we need to allow a certain amount of natural inequality to emerge in order to have the greatest human flourishing. We have to have some attention to disparities, but only some attention, as with the economy. It's got to be, we've got to be looking at that utilitarian uh, outcome of human flourishing across all dimensions, not just the equality dimension. Professor Eric Kaufman, thank you so much for joining me on The Forge. Thanks, Harrison. Pleasure.